what I liked about Mastermind but before I, I signed up was it was just everything, you know, so it had the, the monthly meetings that were good, it had the webinars every couple of weeks. But ultimately, I then had the community because I was overseas at, at the time. Yeah. I think it's quite difficult to explain to people what Mastermind is because what I actually got from it was completely different to what I thought I would do when I went on. You know, I went on it just to earn money. That was it, I thought. Yeah. During the year of Mastermind, I acquired about four million of assets. Uh, out complicating it to me, property is get your strategy, source it, fund it, and then do the admin stuff. And that I don't do what I do now for for the money. You know, I, I could just stop now and, and not work's the short answer. So hello and welcome. It's Simon Zucci here, and this is another of our 100K Club interview series where we're interviewing people who've done our Property Mastermind program and a very short amount of time have got to over a hundred thousand pounds profit on an annual basis from their property investing. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Billy Torres. So welcome, Billy. Hi, Simon. Nice to be here. Well, thank you so much for agreeing to come on. You've got an amazing story, Billy. I'm sure people are going to get huge value. I'm sure they're going to pick up lots of golden nuggets and also be really inspired about your journey. Um, so first of all, just start off by telling us a little bit about yourself, Billy. So where are you from and, and what did you do before property? Yeah, so I'm based in Manchester now. And after Mastermind, so I did Mastermind in 2015. Yep. And then um, so I was in the April intake and then at the end of the 12 months, I, I came back to the UK. So based myself in, in Liverpool, um, where I built up a business effectively over the 12 months. And then I moved from Liverpool to Manchester a couple of years ago as I started to diversify outside of Liverpool in, into Manchester. Because by that time, quite a wide portfolio in Liverpool and the banks were saying, yeah, we like what you're doing, but we'd also like you to be in some other cities. Um, I'd actually invested in property, like a lot of us. I bought my first house, 2001 apartment that, that, that I lived in. It's kind of 2001 up to Mastermind. I'd really kind of trundled along. I think when I came into Mastermind, I had about eight houses, but some of them were with joint venture partners. It was quite a mixed bag, you know, um, stuff in Ireland that was underwater, stuff in Bulgaria that is still underwater. <laughs> but, but I'd also, you know, I'd started to get a, a couple of multi-lets and, the reality for me was, Simon, probably for about, you know, I'd, what I'd done before, I built up my portfolio on the side when I was a management consultant. Yeah. And um, I really got more motivation and engagement from what I was doing myself in, in the property than what I was doing in the, the day job. Um, yeah. And I thought I was relatively well read, you know, well paid job, six figure salaries, working overseas at the time in, in Dubai, I was a partner for a, a consulting firm, but I was just surprised by a lot of other people who, in my view, had less experience than me and potentially less access to funds than me, but they'd managed to go full time a lot quicker than, than, than what I had. Yeah. And it was really on, on that basis, I'd read a couple of um, you know copies of YPA and seen investors that'd been successful, and typically all of them had taken one step back to go two steps forward. And that was really doing some investment, you know, whether it was doing your mastermind or, or another program with a, with a competitor. And I really just took the time to kind of research the different options that were open to me, spoke to a lot of the top five performers yeah. who were on stage. And what I liked about mastermind but before I, I signed up was it was just everything, you know, and so it had the, the monthly meetings that were good. It had the webinars every couple of weeks. But ultimately, I then had the community because I was overseas at, at the time. Yeah. Also, then had a coach that would kind of help me through it, and then I got two days mentoring. So, I really like the kind of the holistic experience of it. At the same time, I think it's quite difficult to explain to people what mastermind is because what I actually got from it was completely different to what I thought I would do when I went on. You know, I went on it just to earn money. That was it. I thought, yeah, go on, I'll buy a million pounds of property, you'll get the fifty k of income, and that gives me enough to leave the day job with with what I currently had. The, yeah. the reality is that so that was just a small part of it. And it was actually a lot of the other stuff that you don't sell on it in terms yeah. of what I got. Particularly, I was used to how stuff is done in the corporate world. I'm not really used to kind of, I suppose, mindset shift and just entrepreneurial shift as well is, is what it yeah. gave. So you, you thought you were going on to get the knowledge how to because you already had some knowledge, obviously, you had yeah. some success. You thought you were going for the knowledge, but it turned out to be far more than that, really. 
Yeah, and, and don't get me wrong, I still, the, the, the 10% of the knowledge that I didn't know that I got in Mastermind enabled me to really fast track. You know, as I yeah. said, at the start, you had eight individual houses before Mastermind. So that's up to 2015. I bought my first house 2001. So it took me 15 yeah. years to get eight when yeah. I was working with a salary coming in. And then since doing Mastermind, you know, there's now 40. And, and when I say houses, I mean either a house or, or an apartment, not rooms, yeah. that's 40 houses. So yeah. that's increased 500%. Yeah. in the space of whatever four and a half years yeah what had taken me 15 years before yeah and then also remembering i only i worked for my year in mastermind but then that's all that growth continued growth has been funded from from the business so that what i'm saying even though you can know a lot of stuff that the top 10 percent of stuff and, and it, was, it was some were really silly things like negotiations i remember we talked about that a bit and i always went to the position that to be successful you just must negotiate you must negotiate everything and it wasn't until i did a mastermind when i was actually realized that well if deals work for you and they're going to give you a good return and you're going to be able to do momentum investing and get planning gains then you can actually give the seller everything they want i mean i've, I've actually yeah. given a seller more than what they've wanted as well at times because yeah. i i could do whereas when i think of the past i probably spent too much time negotiating over small amounts um yeah. And then also the, the, the big thing to me, or one of the big things as well, was um, starting to you know get motivated sellers um, to look for the seller rather than the house. You know, up to Mastermind, everything was bought online, either in auction rooms or, or, or with estate agents. And you can still get good deals with them. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. There's, there's still good properties that you buy. Absolutely. But all of a sudden, when I started to go off market and actually look for motivated sellers, it, it became a lot easier. Yeah, and, and better deals, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. So, so a couple of things I just want to just circle back on. One you mentioned, obviously, so you were in a, a very high-paid corporate job being yeah. tax-free over in Dubai, and something that, a theme that's come out from a lot, of, so we've got a number of professionals who've been on this series, and they've been in very good high-paid jobs, and the problem is that's almost like golden handcuffs. You yeah. go, how on earth am I going to escape and replace this level of income. So, and, and I guess you saw property as the root because you already had some property. Did you did you ever think that you would achieve so much as you actually achieved in that year whilst you were on Mastermind? No, 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 not at all. I mean, I, the property I'd bought before Mastermind was, you know, it was, it was a good purchase, but you know, it was a, an ex drunk den in Liverpool. It was a terraced house at 40,000. And, and that's really where I thought um, my future lay was, you know, just doing small terraces, you know, and that was just converting it to, to three bedroom. You know, it wasn't actually going into a big HMO at, yeah. at that stage. And, um, you know, we, we've done six commercial to residential, you know, grade one, grade two that, that we've actually sold out, you know, amazing buildings, amazing end products. Um, you know, I, I, before Mastermind, I would never, ever have even looked at those sort of deals. Yeah, and just tell us, uh, what, what do you? I know you've given us kind of four or five years after where you're up to now with kind of 40 units. What did you, do you remember, what did you actually achieve in that 12 months? You went from eight units up to how many, and what did that give you in income-wise in that 12 months? Yeah, I think I had a quick look at this before. So, so during the year of Mastermind, I acquired about four million of assets. Um, yeah. Two million of them I traded, so two mil, just over two million was um, four office blocks I converted and, and sold off. So that gave me a better chunk of cash to, to yeah. go on and, and buy more stuff. Um, I can't remember the exact number of HMOs, but I, I know I had about 130 um, grand of new income from the deals that I put in. That, and that's after JV had been paid back, after yeah. um, and, 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 um, investor loans had, had, had been paid back. That's so that, that was the income. Yeah, then, profit then, after exactly. mortgages and everything. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, and I guess I don't ask how much you earn, but that's probably pretty close to replacing what you're earning as a as a, a partner in a consultancy. Yeah, absolutely. And that's not. And just remember, I mean, that, that's income. The, the bit a lot of people forget about, and I actually think where you, you do even better is you've got your capital gain as well. Yeah. And and that that you know, whether that's in that year or whether that's in in, in five years, I mean that's one yeah. of the good things of a property. You have got two bites of the cherry. You get yeah. the income, and then you get the capital gain as long as you sell at the right time. Yeah, absolutely. So so that so first of all, replacing that corporate salary is pretty impressive. But then to add to that, 
you did it from overseas. You, you were living in Dubai. You were coming to the UK once a month. And I know you were kind of coming in, you rejigged your flights and things, but that's a big commitment. So I want to know how, how did you do it time wise? Cause you were running a, a full time yeah. job when in Dubai. And also how did you, how did you manage to buy all that property in the UK when you were living overseas? Yeah, well, it's, it's funny, and, it, and it's kind of it's one of the things I've taken. I and mean, when I kind of work with people on, on, on Mastermind now, you have to almost hold people back sometimes. I actually think it worked in my favor. To most people, you would actually see it as, as a negative, but yeah, reality was, and I'll still say it now, but if I look at the Mastermind till now, my most effective year was still when I was working full time. Yeah. And, you know, what one of the reasons is you've got to maximize the time that you've got, you yes. know, and then you don't have like now I've got every day so yeah. I can make that day last as long as it did. Whereas Sometimes what, what, the, the, the tasks expand to the time absolutely. available, right? Absolutely. And lockdown's quite interesting for that as well. So, you know, I've cut back now and some of the reports we were doing, some of the tasks people were doing and actually seeing, does it actually give you value to the business or was it just yeah. a nice thing to do? And, you know, I've, I've probably identified a good seven, eight, efficiency savings just by actually being into lockdown and you know, really testing everything and saying do, do we need this does it actually add value but how I did it was you know it was a you know, busy job and I basically I had two kind of um, whatever sets of drawers in my office one was my private stuff and, and one was work stuff and um, you know we were doing long hours you know we were, we were traveling to Saudi Kuwait wherever but what I just simply did was each day when I finished work, I then locked myself in an office and, and work in for at least an hour. And I focused really on kind of three things. You know, first off I was I'd focus on sourcing. So anything that was going to lead to deal flow coming in, that's where the focus was. Once my sourcing was up to date, I would then focus on finance. Okay, so how are we raising funds? What are we refinancing? What's the cash flow like? And then the third thing I would do is actually focus on the admin stuff and, and the support bit of it. The other thing, you know, I did do to Dubai Friday was a day off, um, which is obviously a day in the UK. So I typically did either work a half day or, or a full day when I then phone up other masterminders, phone up agents, speak to, 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 to the builders, et cetera. I mean, I remember one of the things that you said at the start of mastermind, you, you have a choice. You know, it's not get rich quick. You know, there's, there's just no such thing. In other words, we, we'd all do it. But it is a case that if you really work hard for 12 months, yeah. which is what I did, you know, 30 nights in an aeroplane. So also, you know, when I was coming back, I'd always fly overnight and I'd fly the nights back, um, you know, just, just to, to, to save time. But the really important thing was, and again, I've seen it in lockdown now because we've got challenges about letting stuff, but just doing that one hour on really which is going to be the cash generating stuff for you and again without out complicating it to me property is get your strategy source it fund it and then do the admin stuff and that's all fine but the admin stuff exists you know and even your build of a property exists you know we use architects now we use build teams we, we, we've got contracts where, where the added value is really in sourcing and then sec secondly in finance but Finance is more out there. You know, there, there's, you can go to an investor, you can go to a bank, you can go to a bridging company, you can go to crowd property, but there's a process from that. You go highest debt to, to cheapest debt with, with some caveats in there. You might want to keep some investors on board, yeah. but actually sourcing stuff is really a bit more detective work. So, and, so let, let's talk about that. Let's talk about how did you find most of your deals? What were the, the strategies or methods you used to do that? Yeah, so, so I think the first thing people need to be aware of is sourcing, and it's back to one of the things we kind of talk about. So you want to be looking for the motivated seller, and you need to be aware that, you know, 99% of deals don't work. You know, if you're just going on to right move and you think you've got 10 deals that stack, I'll, I'll guarantee you they won't do in, in the long term. So my view was, still is, and it's what I still do now, is, I just look at all the different strategies that, that were out there. And yeah. um, so some of them, for example, you know, I got deals um, from Gumtree. I yeah. got deals from landlord letters. Um, I got deals, you know, I went to auctions when stuff hadn't been sold and I actually managed to find out who the sellers was because they'd left some insurance letters in the pack. 
and it had their name, and I actually Googled the guy, found out he worked for Goldman Sachs. A lot of detective work then. Exactly, a lot, a lot, lot of, lot of detective work. Um, yeah. Did it, but but what, but what I did was lots of things as well. So then, any time we did a house, I then put a sign on the house saying, you know, um, we buy houses locally. Call call Billy. Put put my number on it. Yeah. Um, we'd also tell the builders on the job that if because people would come up to them in the street because at that time we were probably doing three to four HMOs at a time. Yeah. In quite small area. So a lot of the time people would come up and say, who's your gaffer? Could, could we buy, a, you know, be interested in selling the house? And it was following up on those leads as they came. Yeah. There was one, I'd still got off right move. Um, and it was a funny one. It was actually kind of one of the things you say as well, about going back and following up the person. It actually, it fell through three times before they, they took my offer, which was actually less than, than, than what it was because it was after the stamp. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. not the first time that's happened. Yeah. 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 But, but really, I say to people for sourcing is, you know, and I've never, you know, paid marketing in terms of landlord letters, but I've never had to pay to do leaflets, etc. But, you know, I've put adverts up onto Gumtree. I've yeah. got into property forums and I've searched for Liverpool and just gone through, seen all the posts about Liverpool, contacted the, the person. Again, nine times out of ten, nothing will come from it. But yeah. it's a, first of all, accepting that. And then, you know, once you get, get comfortable with that, and then I think you've also been quite quick at getting rid of the deals that, that didn't stack. You know, so yeah. what you get now is you'll get people who are motivated, but you'll also get people who just want, you know, a very high cost. and They're almost looking at selling it to kind of uneducated people yeah. and it's just having a conversation with them. And in the past, and I get it sometimes when I talk to people, you need to convince them to change your price. Well, you don't. They're, they're not motivated. And guess what? They might get their price, so if they can yeah. do, Good, good on them but actually you know having a conversation with them saying oh no that's just too rich for me you're more experienced you know make, make them feel good because you just never know when their situation changes either yeah absolutely and i, and I think you, you mentioned a couple of things i want to just circle back on one is obviously the importance of of different sources of leads coming in um, yeah. it is definitely a numbers game you've got to accept that and, and also follow up because very often when you're looking for sellers you know they're not motivated enough now but Things change, especially with time. People become more motivated. Deals fall through, and and most investors make the mistake of thinking, "Oh, the agent will come back to me." Well, they may not. They might forget it. They might not be a very good agent. You've got to be proactive, haven't you? Yeah. No. Absolutely. And I think, and I also wouldn't rule out other investors. So the last couple of years, I've bought a couple of deals from other investors. So. One of the challenges I do have now is that, and, and anyone will get this, you know, you, your, co your first couple of deals theoretically could actually be your best because that's all you're focusing on. Once you've actually got a stuff to manage, you've got to do some of the more boring stuff, like speak to the letting agents, you know, make sure the counts are getting done. You've got to work out how you do your maintenance. But once you've, you've then maybe got spare cash because you've refinanced something or you've sold something, and you know, it's kind of a case of, well, again, what's the money going to get in the bank? Well, if I can actually get a deal off an investor for, you know, 15, 20% ROI, it's maybe only 5% below market value, but it's already tenanted and, and it goes live. And, it, and it's just, you know, I spent a lot of time now looking at where my cash is, you know, and it's kind of when I'm running out of cash, I'll look to do a deal where I'm going to get a, you know, add value to get all the money back out so I can go again. But then there's other times when I've got cash that comes in, I'll just look to maximize it and to get a return as, as, as quick as possible on it. So it's really, as you say, is having as wide a variety, in my view, of places you'd go to um, to get stuff in auctions again. So anytime, you know, and I should also say, I don't source every week. I go to a stage when typically I'll be sourcing three, four times a year, but then I just go into full sourcing mode. And so auctions, yeah. I look at, what hasn't sold at auction because all of a sudden you then know the seller's motivated. Yes. Whereas in the past, I used to go into the auction room and you could get, you could be lucky sometimes. And I, I did get one postmaster mine again in an auction room. You go in December, January when they're, where they're not busy. We got some, some, some good deals then. But it's just, you know, knowing what these 10 things are. And then when you're in sourcing mode, just source, source, source. Yeah, that focus is really important. So, so what would you say to people who, who live in England, for example, and they say, oh, my house is too expensive, I can't, I can't do property. 
Well, so, so I've worked with people in London and they've managed to source deals and, you know, get good ROIs on it. Yeah. You know, the further south you go, yeah, you've got to accept that your ROI in terms of your actual net yield will be lower. But these guys yeah. are still getting 15 to 20 percent um, yeah. ROI. So as long as you can borrow money at less than 15 to 20 percent, you're, you're going to be in it. But also, you know, I get a bit concerned when certain people, I would say, go to kind of secondary towns, you know, sort of some of them up, up, up north, um, and, and then come out with deals where, where there's just not the demand and uh, in terms of actual tenants. You know, the, yeah. and, and where I actually, you know, if you actually said to me, could I swap my 40 properties up here for 10 in London with a smaller profit, as in monthly profit, I would do that because I think the, the capital growth in those areas will actually outperform yeah. the the income you get. So even if it's a bit more difficult to make the annual amount you want, you'll get that back in future in yeah. terms of the, the capital growth. And I think one of the things pe people forget as well that it, it's, you know, you're, you're surprised, you're, you're disappointed what you can do in one year, but then you're amazed by what you can do in five years. And, yeah. and once you start to be able to refinance stuff, it's just like a tap you can keep turning on and off. So it might it might be feel harder in certain areas, but I think in a way that's good because it puts a lot of people off. Uh, and actually, yeah. you know, there, there are there are always deals everywhere. If a you believe there are deals, because if you believe there aren't, you, you'll never find any. And also, if you're then taking the necessary action to actually find those, and you're moving quick enough. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can you know, if, I, if you go to a village with sort of, uh, maybe sixty people, that's probably not a sensible place, but. You know, if you're talking about doing HMOs, you know, my kind of advice to anyone is, is go to major cities. I know there's a lot of people, you know, particularly maybe outside London, places like, you know, say Reading by London or maybe Rugby by, by the Midlands. There will be secondary cities that, that will also work for HMOs. Yeah. Um, but certainly, even if, a, if you're close to secondary, say, city and you don't want to travel, if you can't get HMOs, you'll still get single Lets there or you'll get commercial to residential deals that, that, that work so i think it's yeah people need to live in houses um and, and yeah there's there, there's a housing shortage here so it doesn't really yeah. make sense when people say that you can't get a deal you know you, you might have to trade income for capital growth but guess what that's the same if you want to buy amazon shares and google shares they don't give you any dividend but they give you good capital growth yeah exactly yeah and and um so tell us kind of the, the strategies that you really focused on in, in your journey? Yes, yeah, so, so I think what helped me really from Mastermind is, is what I call, you call momentum investing. So that is typically when we would go in and we'd buy houses for you know, typically between kind of 50 to, to 65,000. We do quite a big, so first off, you know, we're, we're getting them below market value, um, probably anything between 10 to 20%, but when you're buying between 55 and 65, and 10%, so only, only five grand, it's, yeah. it's, it's not that big a deal. Um, where it really helped for us was that we then did what I said, you know, uh, momentum investing. So we spent 90,000 on it, you know, we'd go completely back to brick, take the yeah. floor out, we'd go up, we'd add two bedrooms, we'd do a big extension out the back. We're almost doing like, like new build houses. But typically, they would then um, get valued at, say, roughly 200,000. Yeah. So kind of 90% of the cases, that would give me a mortgage of 150. Well, I've just spent 90 plus 60, so I've spent 150 on it. So in yeah. effect, I then get a free house from yeah. it. You get know, all the money out, go again. Exactly. And, just, and, just, and a property left over giving you a great cash flow. I, I, absolutely. Yeah. So that, that that's, you know, to me, and again, that's the good thing about property. You don't, you know, the, the more things that you do, the better a deal can be. But just that, you know, you, so you could do well by buying below market value anyway. Yeah. If you then add value to it, you get the second hit of it. But also, you know, to be quite frank, what's helped me in the kind of last 12 months is, you know, the um, lots um, more competitive rates for HMOs. So when I was overseas, I could only really get Shawbrook Bank. So typically, you know, all my rates were like about 5.5%. Yeah. And then, you know, I've kind of refinanced a lot of them this year. So I've then also gained from an increase of value in the HMO again. So again, yeah. even once you buy something, you then get capital growth, might be four or five years. Yeah. But my point is, by just being in the game, you know, 
do everything you can do to help. If you can buy below market value, that's a tick. If you can add value somehow, and whether that's just going three bed to four bed, two bed to, to six bed, but that's going to give you a tick. And then, you know, don't count on capital growth, but again, history, you know, we can learn from history, you know, yeah. it increases over time. So at one point you will be able to refinance. And, you know, I mean, I've got some HMOs now that are six bedrooms that kind of go revolve at 180, 190. And um, with a mortgage rate, I, my mortgage is now like about £350 on them. You know, yeah. they, 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 <laughs> crazy, they, isn't it? But they, they work as single lets. You yeah. know, the, the reality is if I let them out as single lets, they would still work as well. Yeah. So let, let's talk about let's talk about that funding then. So obviously a lot of people think, well, okay, how did it, you, you must have had loads of money, Billy, because you were an expat, you know, corporate management consultant kind of thing. Uh, surely you had bags of money to fund everything, right? <laughs> no, not really. Um, I didn't, I mean, I, I did have some cash, you know, before, you know, I, I'd just gone through a divorce um, before Mastermind, so I kind of knew what my net worth was, and it, and it was about 400,000. So we, in, in the marriage, we had 800,000. We got divorced, that then got split. But yeah. just to be clear, remember I had seven houses so and, and I bought my, my ex-wife out. So part of that 400 was in those houses. Yeah, so I had to actually raise money. So you didn't have 400 cash then is what you're saying? No, no, yeah. no, no. But, I, but I did have a job. You know, I, stuck, I stuck at the job. Yeah. Um, and then I had, I, I'd refinanced a couple of things. But you know, kind of a couple of things. One, I, I know that's kind of gone from kind of a net worth, you know, again, before, before COVID, we'll see what it is post that. But <laughs> that, that time period, it's, it's gone up, you know, 500%. But the, the reality is, you know, if you're doing those deals when I did momentum investing, you're not actually leaving any cash in the deals. So you're, yeah. you're getting your money back. But I would still say to people that they say, some of the you know, other deals I've done is just by buying a house, holding on to it, and then w whether you get all your money back in year one or you wait four or five years to get the capital growth, you then get all your money back as well. And I think that's a mistake I see other people doing. You know, it's that oh, I want to get the best deal possible when actually a lot of the time just doing your first deal gives you the experience to... Absolutely, absolutely. And, and your, first, your first deal is, is sometimes the hardest because there's all this fear and uncertainty in your mind. And when you actually do it, you think, oh, most of those things I was worried about never happened. And that gives you the confidence to move forward. So I think first is always hardest, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And just you know, thinking of that as well, I mean, I remembered, you know, one of the things, again, I think it was on a pre-Mastermind webinar, when we were just talking about raising, you know, your, your seed capital. I mean, I came into Mastermind with a hundred grand loan from Dubai, but from the bank, you know, yeah. and told them what to buy property. And they, they said, fine. But, you know, it was a hundred grand loan over a five year repayment basis. So I kind of, I funded the payment of that from my job, but yeah. then I was able to then use that to go and buy property. And um, so paying, I don't know, whatever, six, 7% interest on it. So, you know, relatively cheap, funding for, for, yeah. for, for that time period and then again once you refinance it you, you you're just going again basically yeah absolutely and and i think um it, it's uh it, that that's that kind of momentum investing where you can quickly take your money out i think you're absolutely right i think some people if they can't get all of their money out they say oh, i'm not going to do that deal and i think that's a mistake because although even if there's 10, 20, 50,000 left in that property, which in some expensive areas that might be the case. The money that's left in, you get such a high return on that money, it, it's, you could borrow that from someone, give them a good return on their money, and still make lots of money yourself, couldn't you? Yeah, no, 100%. Yeah, 100%. And I'll do that now. As I say, when we refinance stuff now, and I maybe don't have time to actually go and do active sourcing, or there's also how many projects I'll do at a time now, you know, in terms of yeah. managing my own time, only want to have a couple of projects on. So if I've got them on and we've got the developments going on, I would rather actually buy stuff that I can just turn around quite quick. And I think that the other thing that I hear with a lot of people is like, you must have loads of investors. You know, I think you have to kiss a lot of frogs, but you know, even now I probably work with between five and seven investors, but I just work yeah. with them regularly. And what you'll find is there is some people um, who just don't want to be landlords. They don't want the involvement in it but yeah. what you do is they've got some funds and they want to just get paid a set income every month based on that 
and, and they're comfortable doing it. And actually, yeah, I get a lot of time people say, oh, you've got to have, it's almost, they overcomplicate it. You must have this really good investors pack that you must share with people. You must have like 40 shakes in Dubai that you deal with. And it's kind of like, I don't, I don't have any investors from Dubai. You know, all, all the investors I've got are, you know, I've got two that are, that are overseas, but everyone else is local. And, you know, some of them are friends, some of them's family. But some of them are just other people that I've come across in meetings, but I delivered to them what I said I would deliver. Yeah. And, you know, there, there has been times things have sometimes taken longer but you know, yeah. we've communicated that with them. We've let them know, and we've always given them the choice, saying that Look, this is going to take longer. If you want, I can backfill you from somewhere else. Um, but do you just want to wait an extra couple of months and take the interest? And, and every time they've always done that. Yeah, I think it's that communication is the important thing, isn't it? Because we all know that things take longer in property than expected. Sometimes problems happen. And as long as you're communicating, most people, sometimes people need the money for something else, but usually they're okay. And as you say, when... When you when you give the money back to people, often they say, "Well, I don't want it back." Well, yeah, well, you actually have to be careful. So we, we did this with when we'd done some of the deals in Plymouth, you know. So once we'd paid the crowd back, you know, we had then the mezzanine, which was for private investors. Yeah. So we thought, oh, well, we'll help everyone here, and we'll see. You know, as these flats are sold, when do you want your money back? And we said, you know, do you want to be first tranche? Do you want to be middle tranche? Or do you want to be last tranche? Every single person said last tranche. So then we were kind of actually looking a bit stupid because we've then we're going to have to say to the oh, well, you know, sorry, you're actually going to be first tranche. But I think we just said, oh, we sold some more flats. You're you're all being paid back. But everyone, um, and they did. And it's good to know them. Like I've got some, they use it for their school fees. That's what pays the school yeah. fees every year. I've got one other person. That's actually their living expenses. So that's a situation when I have done with with that individual. Um, you know, kept debt out to the person just to keep it going because there's yeah. the risk she would then take it and move it somewhere else so it's you know you've got to cap, follow certain rules particularly with math but then you've got to understand what the person is and you know sometimes it's, it's worth having say that to people now it's probably worth having money in the bank now even if it's going to cost you a little bit of money because i think in q4 q1 of next year there's going to be a lot of deals um, out there for people. It's going to be a very exciting time to get involved in property. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be like rolling back to 2008. I don't think the prices are going to come down that much, but I think people are going to be panicking. There's a lot of people we're going to, who need to sell. We're going to be able to help those people get a real win-win, which is, you know, it's really important the ethical solution, but it's going to be going to be an amazing opportunity, I think. Yeah, I think so. And I think, and again, it, nothing's always, you know, you're never going to get an identical, but I think, you know, if you're looking at, commercial buildings for example going to hmos yeah um, or, or, or to you know apartments um you know or just or you know, to houses residential i think probably pound for pound the value you'll get for some of that stock um you know particularly in secondary um high streets that, that, that just won't work anymore um you know people are, are you could have started to buy some of them recently and even before covid you know it's people are less emotional about it you know they're, they're maybe from a pension fund yeah. and they're kind of busy doing other stuff all of a sudden one tenant isn't there and it's just like oh shit we're, we're not getting a return on it it's a business owner who is actually just tired and, and wants to get out yeah um, yeah you know it, it, re it really wouldn't surprise me if you know if you yeah you know, yeah everyone says you know the best deals or whatever 2008 i'm sure everyone said the same thing in the, in, in the 90s uh, and I, yeah, I, I think if you look for the the, the right building here, um, people will be saying the same thing in five years' time. Absolutely, absolutely. Let's make sure people are taking advantage of it and, and doing stuff now. So let, let's think about, um, have you got a deal you've done that was a life-changing deal? If someone did it, the amount of income is crazy, it's a truly life-changing amount. Yeah, and, and, and I, I knew you were going to ask this, and, and I really would... I'm not saying say, almost avoid doing doing one deal. What has worked for me is doing lots of deals and just yes. following that basic principles. You know, I've got you know, tell you, you know, a house that was, that was pre mastermind that was probably our best buy that I actually did with a joint venture partner that you know we we, we paid thirty three thousand for it um, and it's now you know, it's five bedrooms. We we actually did that as a three bedroom and then we added to it. So we kind of. We got all the cash out the first time, and then we got all the cash out the the second time. You know, so so, so, so that was great. What also for so the other thing I was thinking about when, when I knew you'd asked this, um, 
you know, I've got some figures in, in terms of, you know, the, the stuff in Hamilton Square, we traded over at kind of 2 million. The stuff in Plymouth, we, we've kind of traded over about 4.5 million. What I actually do believe is the best investment is just buy to hold and yeah. keep it. And again, it goes back to that point. But I think too many people almost get things, I've got to have this deal that's going to give this ROI and that's going to give this. You know, the reality is if you actually get a couple of them and if you keep hold of them for long term, and, and I did it with Hamilton Square, that I had investors that bought from me and they flipped the next day. I made about 20 grand apartment. They then made 25,000. I kind of thought, you didn't take any risk. You did, well, they, did, they, they didn't take risk. That's why they invested. But like, you didn't do the work. Um, yeah. And you, 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 you've got a higher return. And that was a very key lesson to me. But, you know, if you can hold the stock for the long term, you, you'll get a second bite of the cherry from it. It's very, it's very tempting when you've added value to something to try and extract that cash out. And I, I've done this in the past. I've, I've bought things. I've done them up. And, and maybe... Maybe the rental income was okay, but it wasn't great. And I thought, well, I'd rather sell it and get the lump of cash. But actually, if I'd held on to it, time would have done, it would have paid for itself. Time would have done its magic trick. And, you know, it would have more than doubled in value. I'd have made so much more money. But sometimes yeah. people are too short term, aren't they? Absolutely. And you just have to find something else to buy as well. You know, and, and the, the selling and buying costs are, are quite significant with it. But, you know, again, what I would say to each people, you know, even... My, you know, my three bedroom, you know, three bedroom student HMOs, you know, they'll bring 600, 700 in um, each each month. So again, you know, that's seven grand. You do five of them, you're at 35. If you, you're doing some bigger HMOs, you know, you'll, you'll be anything from 900 to, to 1200. You don't really need that many of them to replace an average salary. Or, you know, the, the figure I see most people want is 100K. Once, once you get 100K, you're normally quite, content with what you do with your life and, and then i see people that do property they get 100k and, and then they stop they'll actually pay down the debt they'll travel the world they'll, t- they'll typically start another business they'll go off and do another thing yeah. but it's kind of like that's given me the safety net i want i'm kind of comfortable with that i'm now going to do other stuff and then there, there's other people that say no i just want to work in property but I, I you know i might start to go into doing development you know i might start to go and do service to accommodation but that it is an important point because the mistake I do see a lot of people do is they jump the cash or they want to jump cash flow. So they yeah. want to go into flip. So they want to go into development. So they want to do something else. And it's kind of like, if you don't have the money coming in, you don't have that foundation that you really need. Um, and, and that's my view. I mean, the, the one thing that COVID has also taught me has been a bit of a time of reflection. And I'm very clear that, yeah, I love what I do. And, you know, it's, it's not about the numbers, you know, but, you know, the, the biggest thing to me would be like saying, you can't do this now. You've got to go back to the corporate world. You know, what, what I love about what I do is I get to choose my own challenges. You know, so if I want to do a development, I could do that. If it's about having to change stuff from student HMOs to professional HMOs, if it's about trying to refinance the portfolio, that, that, that's my challenges. And yeah. that, to me, just from a health and a mindset perspective, um, you know, puts me in a far better place. You know, and I, I, again, the corporate world's first world problems, but I know I was a lot more stressed in the corporate world, just being in that environment, the constant negotiation, constant going back and forth. You know, I mean, I don't do what I do now for, for the money. You know, I, I could just stop now and, and not work's the short answer. But I, I do what I do because I get to choose my, my, my own um, projects. And again, to get to, you don't have to jump into 100 grand a lot to start with, but you know, if you take it in stages, I do believe, you know, you know, whether it's even just one house in a year, you know, as soon as you can do one house in a year, you know, if you take this as slow as you'll do it, one house in a year, the next year you'll be able to do two, the next year you'll be able to do four. And lots of people do it a lot quicker than that, yeah, but but that gives you seven houses straight off, you know, and if they're yeah. at 10 grand each, that's that's 70K. And, and as I say, that, and there's nothing wrong with doing stuff slow either. Because once you get to 40 houses, it's kind of like, shit, what am I going to do now? You know, it just gives you challenges. You know, just a different challenge that, that you have. So, Billy, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. I wonder if you've got a couple of tips that you can share with people so they can kind of emulate the success that, that you've had. Yeah, so I think there's a couple. You know, when you know, when I think back to your question, about probably what was the best investment I actually made? 
I'll still argue mastermind is what That's the right answer, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> well, gave me the knowledge and the, the motivation, just a different way of thinking to be able to fast track stuff. So I do think, you know, investing, you know, in the right program with someone that's actually done what you, what you want to do is key. Yeah. I think the, the second thing, something a lot of us, and I'll probably fall into now, is don't overcomplicate stuff. You know, property, lots of people buy houses and they live in them and it's not really that big a challenge. So actually, when you think about your investment deals, work out how to source stuff. You know, I wouldn't recommend using sourcers. Get to know your area, get to become a detective, get to know the streets, get to know the different ways to, to source. And that's what will really give you the competitive advantage. You know, Finance, you can, you can learn. There's only so many banks you can borrow from, so many bridging companies, so many ways to um, ra ra raise money. And then, you know, doing developments and managing letting agents and all that, all those processes and systems are there. So really focusing on sourcing because that'll give you the competitive advantage. And also the, the third thing is, you know, remember everyone's on their own journey. And the one thing to me about property that I particularly, I mean, there's lots of things I like, but one of it is just the time in the game. You know, if you're in it long enough, you even if you just went out and you bought stuff that's market value, you know, and they were just single let, they were giving you a couple hundred quid cash flow. If they then increase by 50 grand over five years or a hundred grand over five years, you get to pull 75% of that back out. Yeah. And then also we talked about this before again, I'll look to stuff that, you know, now, for example, there's a lot more student landlords. So there's an opportunity. Well, could you actually put that as a service to accommodation? Could you actually put that to the professional market? You can look to reposition assets the whole time. If you're in it with, with a long time period, you know, the, fu the fundamentals of why property work is, it's really the only business that you can use leverage for. You know, you go and try and do a training program. No bank's going to say to you, we'll lend you 75, 80% of it, and we'll let you keep all the capital growth and we'll let you keep all the income. You know, that, that's why property works. Yeah, but it yeah. also works because it's supply and demand in the UK. You know, we're an island. We've got a growing population. So um, you know, like HMO is a, is a great way to really, really turbo boost stuff. But, you know, if, if you think it's too complicated and you don't want to deal with multiple tenants, do single let. You know, there's a huge supply out there for single let. I'd be a bit wary of commercial, but I still think, you know, if you're doing commercial and you look for, you know, things like barber shops, you know, can't get our hair cut online. Think of what will be the commercial entities that, that will last the long, long term. So, you know, whether it's residential or whether it's commercial, there's opportunities but again you know i wouldn't make things complicated you know, commercial will change and it'll change a, a, a lot quicker yeah. i can't see how we're going to move from not staying in houses or or, or apartments no. we always as you say we always need someone to live right and that's Absolutely. always going to be the way you know yeah. as long as as long as the population keeps on increasing in this country which generally it does because of higher birth rates and longer life expectancy the long-term trend is up in the uk and that's what's yeah. And, and guess what? If, if it changes, then that, that, that's life as well. And then you yeah. can kind of look at some some other asset class or some other country where, where it's happening. But again, you know, I mean, I've lived in the Middle East. I've kind of seen the volatility they have in house prices, and, and you know, it's even the legal system we've got here, the finance system. You know, I, I do think it's probably the best place, and it's big enough that there's enough you know cities to go to. It's not like a America, which is, is almost like Europe, you know, where you've got some states that are bankrupt, some states that are, are going, you know, really well. And, and, and the UK is, you know, we're, we're very, very lucky to be born working here and, and have the opportunity to invest. And also for overseas people, you know, I've worked with a lot of, you know, European nationals and people from Australia who've come here, yet they have to be a bit longer in terms of class to citizens, what, what, whatever, to, as long as they become mortgageable. But they'll typically get that within a couple of years and then they're protected the same as the rest of us. Yeah, fantastic. Billy, the final thing is, um, how has this experience uh, on Mastermind, has it changed your life? You've already mentioned quite a few, but if you can sum it up in a couple of words, that'd be great. Yeah, it really goes back to, to what I said before. You, know, what I all, I mean, it's, what I always wanted was my time back. You know, I did feel that I was almost captured in the corporate world, particularly because I was overseas. My son was here, um, 
So what what I I thought I just wanted time to choose, you know, to do experiences and, and to have the money. Um, you know, realize quite quickly it's not actually about the money. But again, the money helps. It's easy for me to say it's not about the money because I've got I've got a good income from it. But you know, I I do now. And of course, I've got financial targets, and we keep working towards it. And and it changes. You know, it goes from getting your cash flow into okay, what legacy am I going to put in place, and what's that going to be for Archie? What's it What's it going to be for his kids? So you need some stuff to to keep going. But the biggest thing for me is my time but giving me the opportunity to choose what I want to spend that time on. And, and I love property, so I'm still going to spend most of my time on property, but I get to choose what bits of property I want to focus on each year. Fantastic. Billy, um, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, you've had a truly inspiration. I'm sure many people are going to be inspired watching this. You've given some fantastic golden nuggets that people can follow as well. So thank you for coming a mastermind, for trusting the process, for just being persistent and obviously being involved and helping us to help other people on the journey as well. Really appreciate that. Appreciate your time. And uh, just thanks for the interview. Pleasure. Nice to connect again. Thanks, Billy. Take care. Cheers.